would please turn with me in your Bibles once again to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews 11, looking at verse 13 this week. If you haven't been here for a while or you're visiting this morning, I've been preaching through the book of Hebrews. And up until this point, the author is reminding his audience and teaching his audience that faith and grace is not something that is new or something that was created in the first century or even something that comes with Christ. But faith and grace is something that has been there from the foundation of the establishment of God's covenant, not just with Abraham, but even down to the beginning of creation that God is the one who would do the work. And so he goes through this list of Old Testament saints who lived and died and served by grace because they had faith in the one who was to come. And after going through this list for a few minutes, he pauses and recaps and rethinks. And he says in chapter 11 of Hebrews and verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The author of Hebrews opens this chapter by introducing his audience to this concept where he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. And I brought that to your attention and marveled at those words that faith, which is often something that is dismissed as amorphous and childish, in the word of God is called the substance and the evidence. Because faith is based on reality. And if you remember that sermon and the other sermons, I remind you that you don't have faith that's based on nothingness. You have faith based on evidence that already exists. You have faith in someone's credentials that what they say to you is most likely true. You have faith in the experience of a friend that you can trust them for what they say and what they're going to do or that they're going to show up. If someone is usually on time, you can have faith that they're on time. See, faith is not blind. Faith is always based on evidence. And so here, the author of Hebrews expands upon that and shows that they had a trust in the source of their faith because he had demonstrated himself worthy and because his words were reliable and his actions were reliable. We've worked through this faith chapter so far. I hope you have had it impressed upon you how vital and essential that faith in the God of the Bible actually is. And I hope that you've had it impressed upon you that faith is not something that is exclusive to the true faith of the Bible, but that you're going to exercise faith no matter what you live for, no matter what you believe in in this world. And ultimately, you can boil that down to two faiths. You can boil that down to a faith in self or a faith in things that are seen and a faith in things that are carnal and a faith in things that are very fragile and fallible and a faith in things that have failed time and time again. Or you can have your ultimate faith in the one who is infallible in the one who has given you a reason and understanding for what you see and what and how things function and how things will end up. And you can sort everything out based on the faith in the almighty and perfect God. 
Already we've seen how that faith has demonstrated itself with creation, with Abel, with Enoch, with Noah, with Abraham, with Sarah. And he says in this pause here in verse 13 that these people, they died in their faith. They died in faith. Now that's not the purpose of his teaching here, but it's still a powerful statement nonetheless because we read about lives in the Scripture. And then we're told that they died. They died in faith. Now God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living. He's not the God of the dead. Their soul, their essence, their character, who they are in their Savior in Christ lives on in him, absolutely. And one day they'll be resurrected in a glorified body as all of us who are in Christ will be. But for the time being, in their flesh, under the curse, they died. It's a powerful statement because it serves as a reminder. And it serves as a reminder of why we need the faith. And why we even seek it. And why God has even revealed it to us. Because the truth of the matter is we are all going to die. And everything else that this world has to offer you cannot offer you a solution to that. It might be able to make you as comfortable as you can here. This is still not saying all that much. It might be able to promise you a, a good life and a good way of functioning and living, but it still won't be able to stop you from death. And it still won't be able to help you in what's going to come after you do die. The Bible holds nothing back. It says you're going to die, and death is something that's very plain from beginning to end in this text, and it mentally prepares us to either seek the solution and the way out from eternal death, and then once we found that solution, to cope with it. These all died in faith. But you, Christian, you one who has that faith, do not have to fear that death. Because if you die in faith, you have an assurance of the best available existence for eternity, forever and ever. These Old Testament saints, it says, did not see the ending fulfillment of God's promise to them. They did not see the millions upon millions of people who would be born after the promise, as was explained in previous sermons. These saints that we've spoken of so far in the chapter didn't even see the establishment of the nation state in Israel in its fullness. They saw those promises afar off. And even farther off were the promises that are fulfilled in the first coming of Messiah in Christ that inaugurate the spiritual kingdom here and now that we're part of, part and party to. They didn't see the ending of those promises. They didn't see the fulfilling, fulfillment, but they trusted them. They believed in them. And they knew that when they died in that faith, they would have that promise. They were certain that the message of those, of those promises were sure and reliable. And what was far off for them is not as far off for you. Don't forget that. Their faith was expressed and put in types and shadows. Their faith was in a fuzzy, amorphous image of who Messiah would be. You've seen him. You can read about him. He was here on the earth. We know what he said. We know what he did. We know that he died. We know that he was raised again. We know that he established his church. We know that his message continues to be proclaimed as a testimony and an evidence of who he was and what he did and why he came and what he established. You have a greater light than they did. You have a greater fulfillment of the promise than they did. And yet there are still promises that are far off for us that we do well to trust in and have our faith in just as they did. Because now the word is here in a way that they did not have. And that word brings with it a certain even greater assurance of faith than even these people had. Nonetheless, it says they had an assurance. And that assurance enabled them to embrace their God in faith and to embrace their God by faith. What does that look like? To embrace God looks like the person who seeks God's way and loves God's character more than all the enticements and voices 
of this present carnal empire. To embrace God is to love God more than any other distraction or any other thing that you do on the earth. And it also means that you are working and living for God through everything you do and experience on the earth. It's a firm embrace that also knows the grip on God's end. And the grip that tells us that he holds us and that his rod and his staff, they comfort us. The rod to beat off the enemies, to protect his flock and his sheep. The staff to pull back in the sheep from danger and from wandering and from being lost. It is knowing that God has given his angels charge over you and they shall keep you in your ways lest you dash your foot against the stone. I mentioned that in Sunday school last week. I believe it was last week. You remember that's one of the verses that Satan uses in his temptation of Jesus when he tells him to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. He says, jump off. You trust God so much? Go ahead, jump off. See what he does. See what happens to you. Don't you trust him? But of course, Satan doesn't finish the verse. Jesus finishes it for him. Jesus says, he says, he says he'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. See, Satan misses the aspect that says to keep you in all your ways. God promises that he's going to protect you in all the ways that he's given you to serve him. He's not going to protect you if you jump in front of a train. He's not going to protect you if you jump off a building for no reason. These are things that would bring self-destruction. That's foolishness. That's sin. There's no wisdom in that. But if you are in the will of God, and you are doing what you have to, and you are doing what's right in this world, I believe you can go into those situations with a confidence that there's going to be a level of protection for you. You're immortal until you fulfill God's plan for you. You know that. And so the grip of God holds you. The embrace of God is embracing that concept of his friendship, of his lordship, and of his governance. And then when you know that grip, and you know his charge, then you can live in the freedom of that knowledge and the freedom of that truth. And life becomes a lot easier because you are resting in a force that is greater than yourself and your own strength. When you have the assurance when you embrace God, by doing those things, the text tells us that you confess where you live and where you're from and where you belong and where you're going. Having seen them afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. <laughs> Assurance, embrace, and confession, they all go together. And with an embrace of God's kingdom, you declare to a hostile world that you are not bound by its rules and its fears. You declare to a world that you are a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. I've always resonated with that aspect of Christianity. I've never felt completely at home in our culture and in our world, even from the time I was a little kid. And if you are uncomfortable with the way the world is, and you are uncomfortable with the masses and the way things move and have their being, I would suggest to you that that's a good thing. Because you know very well that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And you know very well that things aren't quite right. And if you don't fit in, then I guarantee you that God has a place where you'll fit the best. Don't try and find a little niche group that's still in rebellion. You'll never fully fit in with them either. But you will fit in with your Creator. You will fit in with the one who made you the way you are and gave you the interests you have and gave you the skills that you have and gave you the abilities that you have. You'll fit in with him. And if you confess your assurance and your embrace of him, you'll also be confessing that you're a stranger here. You're a pilgrim. You're moving through this world, moving to a greater goal, moving to a greater place, moving to a greater future. And God in that movement through this strange land has a use for you here as well. And you'll find the greatest fulfillment and assurance in his use for you right here. You are a stranger, you're a pilgrim, but you're also an ambassador of the court of heaven to the court of this world. And the church is your embassy. 
You're a stranger in this world, but a stranger who has a calling from the king on high. And that calling reminds you of this country's very transient nature. His calling reminds you that you'll never quite find a home here as you're a stranger and a pilgrim. Uh, if you've been in Sunday school and going through the Revelation study, you'll remember that you go through the seven trumpet blasts. And I remarked that those trumpet blasts serve as a warning of the temporary nature of this earth. There are trumpet blasts all around us every day. The final trumpet blast is God's coming, but up until his coming, there are trumpet blasts that remind us that we'll never find a home here every day. When you see tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanoes, that's a trumpet blast that this world is not a resting place. When you see pandemics and sickness sweep, sweep the land, that's a trumpet blast that this world is not a resting place. When you see people being beat up for no reason whatsoever, that's a trumpet blast. When you see people persecuted for no reason, that's a trumpet blast. When you're in school and you see, see somebody being picked on unjustly, that's a trumpet blast, that things are not right. This place is not home. When you see corruption, even in the best of ideals, that's a trumpet blast. And so we heed these trumpet blasts and they remind us not to put down roots here. You'll not find a comfortable and a permanent home here. And you know in history that every human experiment and every human endeavor that has sought to make heaven on earth here has failed miserably. Even when it's done in the name of Christianity, it has failed miserably. When it's done in the name of God and somebody sets up a city and says, this is our city set on a hill, glory to God in the highest, you will inevitably find mistakes there because you can't create heaven on earth. When socialists reject, when socialists and Marxists in history have rejected God and said, we're going to build the perfect society, it never works. When monarchy says, my kingdom will be the greatest kingdom on earth, it never works. When a republic gets together and says, we're all enlightened people, let's all vote and let's have representative government based on documents and laws. You'll find a decent society there, but you won't find a perfect one. You won't find one without flaws. You won't find one without infighting. You won't find one without mistakes. And you won't find one without disaster. You will always find that you cannot have total rest here. And I would suggest to you, you would find that even in this embassy, even in this church. Because God's people, though redeemed, are still marred by the curse of sin in their flesh. I'm going to say it again. I'll say it all the time in sermons. I'm always saddened when people walk away from church because they say the leadership of the church has sinned or, there, or something went wrong amongst the people in the church and there was something that was scandalous or disastrous. You don't go to church for the example of the people. You go to the church because you are all under the example of Christ. If somebody messes up in a church, they're wrong too. And the only answer to that is repentance and correction. Don't give up on the church because of people. The church is not about people. It's about God. And it is an embassy of the greater kingdom where you will find home. You won't find a home here. We're told in Matthew 6.33 very famously to seek first the kingdom of God. And then everything else will be added unto us. Why should we try if we know we'll never have a home here, if we never, know there'll never be perfection here. Some people would be very discouraged by that. You mean to tell me that there's never going to come a point where I'm going to hit the mark totally and all will be well? Why should I even bother? Why should I even try? Well, the scripture tells us very plainly to labor for the master and for his sake, not just for selfish results. And I would suggest to you that if you're laboring for the master, you could put just as much effort just as much desire for, correct, for the correct procedure, just as much emphasis on beauty and on strength as when you're looking for a perfect outcome. Only when you labor for the master, you'll find that the reward is much more satisfying because there really is no failure at the end. It's very common in our day for my generation to be lambasted or younger generations to be lambasted as the participation trophy generation. And I will confess the weaknesses to that. But when I think a little more deeply about it, 
in an, in an almost kind of sort of related way, God's kingdom is a participation trophy uh, uh, kingdom as well. You don't ever win the game. He wins the game for you. Christ is, is asked, what must we do to work the works of God? He says, believe on the one whom he has sent. Even Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto you by him. Just, just participate in me, and I'll make sure you get everything you need. People misunderstand the parable of the talents so often, and they use it for fear-mongering. You know, it's the parable where the master gives so many talents to one man and so many talent, and two talents to the next, and then one to the third, and they, the first two, they go and they put it to use, and they bring back more for the master when he returns, but the third man, he buries it because he's afraid of the master, and he just gives him back the one that he gave him. Many people use that wrongly, and they say, see? You didn't create enough results for the master. What are you doing for God? You should create more results for God. That's not the purpose of that at all. The purpose of that is to remind you that you need to live in what he has given you for him. In other words, if you've been given a skill or a gift or a personality or, or something, use it for him. Don't bury it and sit and sit on it and do nothing. When he suggests they put it into the marketplace so that it grows interest. That's not them creating results out of the talent. That's, that's another force doing the work, but they're benefiting because they're putting it to use. So when we seek the kingdom of God, we're putting who we are to use for him. And when we live for what God says, we diminish this selfish pride that says, it's all about me, I have to achieve. And we say, I'm going to do good because I serve the one who is the originator of good. I'm going to do what God says. I'm not going to worry whether it's practical or not, and I'm going to trust God to fill in the gaps of practicality. I'm going to do what he says is right and trust him to add unto that all the things I can't control. When we do that and when we embrace that, then there's no real failure possible. None. If you've done your best for the glory of God and you've put your greatest effort into something for the glory of God, then who cares what society thinks, whether it's a failure or not? doesn't matter. If you've done it for God, it can't fail. And you mind this world's distractions from that and gaslighting against that. When you live as a pilgrim, your enemy will always try to distract you from the focus of your pilgrim walk. I mean, some of you are familiar with Pilgrim's Progress and all the distractions along the road as he goes towards the, the heavenly kingdom. Well, those distractions are real. They're here every day. They're going to pull us one way or the other. Look here, look there, go this way, go that way. It'll either distract you with absolute sin of some kind and pull you away from glorifying God or it'll distract you with futility and misguided projects that don't necessarily serve him or advance what's around them. It'll draw your motives away or it'll draw away the results uh, that God would like to see. I never heard the term gaslighting before the year 2020. That was a new term in my vocabulary. But it's interesting how it's been used and it's interesting how it's, been, how it's entered our common vernacular. But it's also interesting how it's been a tactic of Satan from the beginning. Don't pay any attention to the word of God. You shall not surely die. What are you, crazy? Why would you think that? Why would you do that? Why would you live that way? Don't you see the reality of the situation? The greatest reality we could ever know is what's spoken of in the word of God and in what's been established by Christ. Don't believe the gaslighting of the enemy that says you're fine, everything is fine. You're a stranger in the pilgrim on the earth, you know everything's not fine. And you need to trust your creator and your designer. Keep on that road, pilgrim. Stay a stranger on the earth, and it's okay to be different. Have you ever marveled at how different the Lord Jesus was? He always was different. Foxes have holes, but the Lord Jesus had no place even to lay his head. That's different. What king would live that way? 
what he said was so radically different that people's, in, in, people's uh, adm admiration of him turned to a confusing, uh, despising attitude at the end. People always despise those who are different. God is different. And you as a person of God are very different. And that's a good thing. I said a couple weeks ago that there is no shame in wanting something better in the earth. There's no shame in that. And I would suggest that even secularists display an undeniable existence of God when they look at the earth and they say things are not the way they should be. We should make things better. Because by being dissatisfied with the way things are, they show an innate understanding of how they know that to the first, in the first place. How would you know that? What, what is your standard that things are not right? What's your standard for right? Your standard must be God. <laughs> Otherwise, everything would be fine. Status quo would be fine. It'd be just the way it is. I stand firm in saying that progress is not a dirty word. But progress must have a blueprint. Progress must have an architect. Progress must have instruction. Uh, the Christian should be the most progressive person there is because for the Christian, progress is absolutely linked with reform. Oh, we say we are reformed Christians. We believe in the Reformation. We might as well say we are progressive in that because we want to progress towards what God says, which is the best instruction for humanity. Our blueprint, our book, our foundation, our architect, our design is rooted in what is objective and sure. We want the best, and the best is God's way. And these people in this chapter saw a better country for the same reasons. They understood that things were not right here, the promises were far off, and they looked for something better. And they looked for that something better, knowing the guarantee of the king. God has guaranteed that his people will inherit that perfect kingdom. And as we know those promises far off, we represent them now. Every time you do something in faith, you are bringing a little bit of God's kingdom into this dark world. Every time you do something by faith, according to what God has said is good, you bring more light into this world and more of his kingdom overtakes more of this devil's kingdom. If that is musical talent, if you've written a book, if you are good at selling a product, if you're good at teaching a skill, if you're good at coding or organizing a database or creating art or treating a patient, or stewarding the environment, or preaching a sermon, or fixing a, a broken object, all of these things, even if they seem mundane, when you do them in faith, you are bringing God's kingdom into this world and you are making something better. And don't dismiss that. Because as you are looking and walking on that pilgrim pathway towards that better and eternal city, you know the guarantee of the king, you know the end result is his, and you are walking and living by faith to bring him and his personality here, even though you have to fight against so many forces to do that. You're still establishing Christ as a child of Christ. Advancing what is good, you see a glimpse of that eternal city whose builder and maker is God. Are you living in faith? Are you living for that kingdom? I'm always amazed at, I'm always amazed at how there is a YouTube channel for every possible thing you could think of now. I've said that before. If I want to know what razor blades to shave with, there's a YouTube channel for that. If I want to know what, how, how I should be brushing my hair, there's a YouTube channel for that. If I want to know about the nuances of toy train sets that were built 50 years ago. There's a YouTube channel for that. It always amazes me how people can devote so much time and energy to one specific thing and then make a, a whole YouTube channel about it. Well, 
you know, you could do that with anything. But at the end of it, God must be in the center. It's better to be obsessive about God than that one interest that you would devote a channel to. It's better to be obsessive about God and say, I'm going to glorify God through this one interest and establish his eternal city and help people through that and make this world better. Christ says, take no thought for your life. For your heavenly Father knows what you need even before you ask him. Live and walk by faith, not by sight. Trust him and seek him. And you'll find rest for your soul. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. We have very challenging words in the Gospels, particularly in Mark 8.35, where Christ says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will find it and save it. Interesting thought. When you surrender your life and say, I am not my own, but I belong to the Master, you'll find abundance. But if you're worried about losing your life every day and you obsess and fear and grunt and groan and strain and complain and rage, you'll lose that life. You won't enjoy it anyway. You'll miss the, the beauty of it. You'll miss the perfection of it. You'll miss the architect of it. But the stranger and the pilgrim knows what it is to lose their life and to be guided along the path by the great glorious God. Move on home. Move on home, serve the king, establish his empire, trust his results, die in faith, and live forever in Christ. The message of the glorious good news that sets us free and establishes his kingdom and his promises far off but nearer than we realize. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we move into another new year, may we establish your kingdom and advance your cause, trusting you, losing our life, dying in faith, being a stranger and a pilgrim, but finding a comfort and a safety in that, not a trepidation. May we love you and seek you first. May we enjoy you fully. And may we indeed, as you've told us to do, believe on the one whom, you, whom has been sent, you, and find that everything else is added unto us after that. May we trust the Master more than the results. And may we indeed delight and seek your face. Bless us in this, encourage us in this, build us up in this, strengthen us in this, and go with us in all these things. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If you would take your hymnals again.